Welcome everyone. Uh, good morning or uh, good evening, depending on uh, where you're joining us from. Uh, and welcome uh, to uh, this session or this lecture uh, hosted um, by uh, the uh, Delta on the Move uh, project uh, at the Hong Kong Institute uh, for the Humanities and Social Sciences here at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, I'm Gassan Morzin. Um, the Delta on the Move project, which, uh, as I said, um, uh, is hosting uh, today's lecture as a new uh, collaborative uh, research project we are hosting here uh, at the uh, uh, Institute um, that is uh, convened by uh, Dr. John Wong, who is uh, joining me here today. Uh, and the project um, uh, looks uh, at uh, the historical roots and the global reach uh, of the Greater uh, Bay Area. Um, and um, we're sort of starting out uh, at the moment with a series um, of lectures, and this lecture uh, is, is one of them. Um, and today uh, we are very pleased and very uh, excited to uh, welcome uh, uh, to um, this lecture series, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, jo Jolt Harmore. Um, she is an assistant professor uh, of history at Nanyang Technological University um, in Singapore uh, and works on both modern Chinese and uh, Southeast Asian uh, history. Um, and her writings um, have uh, appeared in a, a range of leading um, uh, journals, um, including the Journal of Asian Studies, uh, where her new article has just come out uh, that is also connected to uh, what she's going to talk about today. Um, her first book um, called Migration in the Time of Revolution, China, Indonesia and the Cold War came in 2019 and uh, also to much um, acclaim. Um, and uh, after that first project, she's now uh, working on a new project uh, on Shenzhen, uh, and uh, the special economic zones uh, during reform and opening up uh, in China. And it is also something uh, that she's going uh, to talk uh, to us uh, about today. Um, her talk today uh, is uh, entitled um, uh, Use Hong Kong to Construct Bao An, uh, Shenzhen during the Mao era and the origins of China's um, reform uh, and opening. Now, before I hand over uh, uh, to Dr. Zhou, um, just a few uh, uh, formalities I should point out. So um, the uh, talk today uh, is in the webinar format. Uh, that means that um, so Dr. Zhou will talk for around uh, 40 minutes and then we'll have time uh, for Q&A. Um, because this is the webinar format, please uh, submit any questions you have uh, for Dr. Zhou uh, through the Q&A button in Zoom. And uh, during the Q&A uh, period, I will then um, uh, read them out and uh, Dr. Zhou can then um, uh, reply to them. Um, but uh, enough from me. Uh, Dr. Zhou, if you are uh, ready, um, please feel free uh, to start. Oh, thank you very much, Gassan, for the generous introduction. I'd like to thank Gassan and John for inviting me. Uh, so I'd like to share my screen now. Okay, can everyone see and hear me all right? Yeah, that's very good. Okay, yeah, I got started. So as Gaza mentioned, my talk today is based on a recently published article on the Journal of Asian Studies. I'd like to thank my friends and colleagues uh, for their feedbacks on my earlier draft. Located, oh, sorry, located, located immediately north of Hong Kong, Shenzhen is the first and the most successful special economic zone in China. Today, Shenzhen is known as the home of Huawei and Tencent, China's flagship technological firms. However, during the Mao era, the geographic equivalent of Shenzhen, the Baoan County, was famous or infamous for being the gateway for illegal migration to Hong Kong. From 1951 to 1980, at least 1 million undoc undocumented immigrants from the mainland entered Hong Kong through Baoan. More than 130,000 Baoan natives tried to immigrate to Hong Kong, and the majority of them actually successfully obtained legal residency there. In 1980, the year when the Shenzhen Special Economic Zone was created, fewer than 330,000 residents were left in Shenzhen. The audience today will be familiar with Shenzhen's from rack to riches story under reform. From 1979 to 2009, with the influx of immigrants from the interior and of investment mostly from Hong Kong, Shenzhen's GDP grew at an average annual rate of more than 30%. 
you are probably also very familiar with the official narrative emphasizing how Deng Xiaoping coined the Chinese term Te Chu, special zone, and used the zone to experiment with market-oriented policies. My talk today aims to provincialize the origins of the Shenzhen Special Economic Zone, the very hallmark of Deng Xiaoping's economic statecraft, drawing on materials from the Baoan County Archives, the Guangdong Provincial Archives, and the Hong Kong Public Records Office. I show that local communist party cadres of Baoan acted as agents of reform more than a decade before reform and opening was officially institutionalized as state policy. Baan's local officials promoted individualized duty-free cross-border trade and informal foreign investment schemes as early as 1961. This strategy framed the relations between Hong Kong and Baan not as a competition between capitalism and socialism, but as a symbiotic relationship in, or relationship of interdependence between a cosmopolitan center and its suburbs. So my research shifts the focus from the power center to the people on the margins and reframes reform not in isolation from, but with reference to the Mao era. When we change our perspective in this way, the border town of Baan presents itself not merely as a physical gateway to Hong Kong, rather, Baoan was a site of acute social economic conflicts and on Europe political negotiations between the local and the national, which culminated the reform starting in the late 1970s. In this sense, the creation of the Shenzhen Special Economic Zone was not a top-down institutional innovation. It was rather the state's belated reconciliation with grassroots practices of what I call leveraging liminality. So I will briefly introduce the historical background since the audience here probably know this very well. Bonn and Hong Kong had once belonged to one single administrative unit. Following the Opium Wars, the two, two places were separated by this 35 kilometer boundary, as you can see from the map here, it extend from the deep bay in the west, cut through the low railway crossing in the middle, and ended on the east coast at uh, Satogu or Chateau Jiao. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, the division remained quite fluid. The movement between mainland and Hong Kong unregulated. Baan residents crossed the border freely and uh, frequently to Hong Kong for family visits, for trade and commerce, and also for agricultural and maricultural production. In late October 1949, the Chinese Communist Party overtook Baan County. In February 1951, the PRC announced the end of free passage between the mainland and Hong Kong. So what does this mean to ordinary people living in Baoan? Technically, after 1951, Baoan residents could no longer visit Hong Kong spontaneously. Instead, they had to acquire a permit from the PRC public security. Those in, in, engaged in everyday agriculture or maricultural production in the British territory needed to register with the local authorities in order to receive a cross water farming license and a sea fishing license. Unlike the militarily fortified demarcation lines in Germany or on the Korean Peninsula, the border between Hong Kong and Baan hardened but remained sufficiently porous for commodities, money, and people to circulate really illicitly. Since the beginning of the treaty port system, Baan people have been engaged in what Michael Zoni called regulatory arbitrage. There have been multiple sovereignties in the poor river Delta, and as a result, there were price variations and also regulatory discrepancies. The Baan people took advantage of these variations and discrepancies. For instance, cross-border living arrangement had been pretty common in the southern part of Baan. Um, in this kind of arrangement, the husband will be working in Hong Kong and the wife and children and elderly will be staying in Baan. And this is a very kind of uh, efficient family economic strategy to maximize uh, income and minimize living expenses. So for these divided households, 
uh, the capitalist market in Hong Kong allowed a male breadwinner to earn Hong Kong dollars and purchase consumer goods, while the socialist system allowed his dependents to benefit from low-cost grain, healthcare, and public housing. The locals summarize uh, this strategy as women serve as the bottom of a walk and men as the lead of a walk. Starting in the mid-1950s, the socialist state diverted food supplies from the countryside to the city to support industrialization. As a result, despite Bond's long-standing commercial ties with Hong Kong, it became just one among hundreds of rural rice bowls. Pressure to meet state acquisition quotas, most bond present, uh, peasants saw no alternative but to plant more grain and neglect cash crops, even if the latter, uh, even if the latter were more profitable when sold privately to Hong Kong. The economic restructuring of Baoan under socialism also disrupted traditional trade routes. Bond's trade with Hong Kong was put under strict central control. For instance, Baan fishermen and oyster farmers were required to turn in their catches for state-organized export instead of selling them privately to the Hong Kong market. They suffer financially, whereas the border was transformed into a mechanism to generate foreign exchange exclusively for the PRC state. In Baan, the reach of the Chinese state to borrow Wu Wen Xu's phrase was constrained not only by the town's distance from the power center, also by its proximity to what the local communist official called a multinational market. Hong Kong supplied the border town with information and resources to leverage against state imposition. Although the Ban people could not entirely escape the incursion of the modern nation state like the people of Zonia in Southeast Asia, they could vote with their feet by fleeing to Hong Kong. Um, the Bond people at the time said openly to the local communist cadre, to escape is brave, to be beaten to death due to illegal migration is glorious. Even if I were to be buried in Hong Kong, the earth there is fragrant. Young Bond woman said, the government vowed to liberate Taiwan. We vowed to marry men from Hong Kong. In the early 1960s, the Baan leadership was headed by Party Secretary Li Fuling and uh, County, Chi County Chief Ji Fengqing. Uh, the two of them recognized that the only way to slow down immigration was to improve the local standard of living. In 1959, uh, to rescue the collaps collapsing national economy uh, after the Great Leap Forward, the Chinese Communist leadership allowed readjustment measures, including the reopening of uh, free rural markets. So during this respite um, from radicalism, Tao Zhu, the top leader of the Guangdong province, openly criticized the Communist Party central leadership's neglect of some universal principles governing economic development. So echoing Tao Zhu, Ba'an leaders also highlighted the need to give recognition to what they call objective economic laws and to supplement the plant economy with market mechanisms. In addition, the Li Ji leadership also identified the structure cause of Ba'an's underdevelopment as excessive state requisition which Ji Fengting compared to a gigantic water buffalo. If this heavy burden were not removed from the peasants, uh, he said, the masses on the frontier would be oppressed forever. In 1961, the Li Ji leadership implemented the Use Hong Kong to construct Baan policy through a 3-5 cross-border trade after fulfilling grain and export acquisition quotas Bahan residents were allowed to sell cash crops directly to Hong Kong in exchange for items such as chemical fertilizer, sugar, oil, medicine, and light industrial products. So what does 3 5 mean? 3 5 means that the weight of the produce sold to Hong Kong was capped at 5 jin or 2.5 kilograms. The value of goods bought from Hong Kong at 5 yuan, 5 RMB, and travel travel frequency between Hong Kong and Baoan at five times per month. 
modern agricultural technology imported through the 35 policy boosted bonds productivity. The opening of cross-border trade also ameliorated the severe shortage of daily necessity in Baoan. For example, the local women were extremely glad to see the arrival of 10 kilograms of sanitary napkins from Hong Kong. In addition to bottom-up liberalization of trade, Li Fuling also lobbied for top-down physical support for an infrastructure makeover, and he aimed to make Baoan into a weekend holiday destination for Hong Kongers. By highlighting the border town's function as a window to showcase the PRC's achievements to the so-called Hong Kong compatriots and international visitors, um, Li Fuling managed to bring to Baoan hotels, restaurants, and other tourism facilities. As you can see the image uh, from the image here, the Shenzhen Theater House was the first modern art performance center in China with air conditioning and an advanced sound system. Throughout the 1960s, Art groups, including the China Central Ballet, the National Peking Opera, the Cantonese Opera Group of Guangdong Province, put on more than 100 performances at the Shenzhen Theatre House. These shows generated significant foreign exchange income through ticket sales. The 1961 mini reform uh, invigorated local economy in Baoan but its regulatory ambiguity also created loopholes for local power holders to reap oversized profits. Compared with the general population, the Communist Party countries enjoy privileged access to the comfort brought by the cross-border trade. For instance, a local commune leader named Deng Xilai was once caught eating a smuggled apple while riding a smuggled bicycle. When challenged, he replied, Everything is imported by the Baoan County government. In exchange for exit permits, some production team leaders solicited bribe. Sometimes women became victims of sexual harassment and rape. Working hand in hand with partners in Hong Kong, Baoan office holders even organized cross-border migrant transportation operations, very similar to contemporary transnational human trafficking rings. Some local leaders openly marketed their services with price tags. For instance, for 500 Hong Kong dollars, migrants could rest assured that their remaining family members in Baoan would receive aid instead of retribution. For roughly a thousand Hong Kong dollars, migrants would be chauffeured to Hong Kong on motorboats um, owned by the production team or communes, so kind of VIP service. Um, while many communist cadres in Baoan acted in an exploitative way towards the less powerful, some also tried to deliver better public services. Some commune or production team leaders would facilitate the departure of quote-unquote potential investors or their family members to Hong Kong in exchange for quote-unquote donations for the construction of communal facility uh, facilities and purchase of collectively owned agricultural machinery and transportation tools. So long as the migrants had legitimate reasons to visit Hong Kong, Li Fuling allowed or encouraged these illicit arrangements. And he framed this kind of arrangement as, quote unquote, the mobilization of financial resources from the patriotic overseas Chinese for Baan's modernization. So the 1961 liberalization uh, revitalized the border town's economy, but it further blurred the line between licit and illicit economic domains. As Philip Tai points out in his uh, book, China's uh, War Ag Against Smuggling, in Mao's China, underground production, consumption, and exchange was an indispensable strategy for individuals and even state-owned enterprises to cope with the constraints of the planned economy. In Baan, it was beyond the local government's administrative capacity and also against its own material interests to strictly maintain a clear line between 
smuggling and legitimate small-scale frontier trade. The Bond government tacitly allowed its residents to exceed the stipulated five jing, five yuan, five times limitation, creating more incentives for them to leverage resources across borders. So individual trade soon developed into a large-scale exchange of rice rice straw from Bond for chemical fertilizers from Hong Kong, usually organized by production teams or communes. A more sophisticated and lucrative commercial pattern emerged later in which Hong Kong goods were resold to inland China from Bond in exchange for agriculture produce to be ex exported back to Hong Kong. This practice of entry port trade was an outright violation of the 3-5 policy, but it didn't invite any interven intervention from the local government. Along by the expansion of Ba'an's great economy, the Guangdong provincial authorities ordered a contraction of cross-border trade in November 1961. Frustrated with the policy inconsistency, many Ba'an residents who initially acted as go-betweens uh, to profit from the two value regimes resolved to settle permanently in Hong Kong. Meanwhile, the information about the relaxation of border controls in Bonn mutated into a piece of fake news about a necessity for undocumented immigrants in Hong Kong in celebration of Queen Elizabeth's birthday. The rumor proliferated in Guangdong and the neighboring provinces, triggering a migrant crisis. In May 1962, more than 100,000 people from all across China arrived in Baan, hoping to reach Hong Kong. The local uh, Baan County archives described the migrants um, as an army charging southward. These desperate migrants ransacked private homes, looted food, and attempted to seize pistols from the People's Liberation Army border control. Some migrants predicted the coming of a third world war with either Chiang Kai-shek or the Soviet Union launching attacks on the PRC. Man many concluded that the Communist Party had collapsed in Bonn, the Chinese troops had defected, the border between China and Hong Kong had disappeared. Despite a sympathetic Hong Kong public, the British colonial authority refused to label the migrants as refugees from the, uh, an oppressive communist regime and carried out immediate repatriation. Meanwhile, the Guangdong provincial government tightened exit restrictions. Provincial leader Zhao Ziyang led an emergency response team to Ban to intercept outbound migrants. As the PRC and the Hong Kong authorities collaborated to re-establish order, the situation de-escalated by the end of May uh, 1962. So the 1962 border emergency was a testament to the devastating impacts of the Great Leap Forward. However, on the local level, the exodus was a byproduct of the innovative but fragile policy design by the bond leaders who tried to create a Maoist prototype of the special economic zone. Starting in 1963, the political atmosphere became heated with radical leftism. The use Hong Kong to construct bond strategy was condemned and its architect Li Fuling was forced to step down. During the Cultural Revolution, Ban was a propaganda outpost, a geopolitical hotspot, and a vital transit station for emigrants. Chairman Mao's Little Red Book and songs such as Sailing the Seas Depends on the Helpsman were exported across the border, fueling the 1967 Hong Kong riots. In the same year, an armed border conflict broke out, the first since Hong Kong's session to Britain in 1842. Throughout the 1960s and early 1970s, cross-border trade was suspended, but immigration never stopped. Ba'an was the easiest route to take for mainlanders escaping the Cultural Revolution, particularly the educated youth or jiqing sent down to the countryside. 
Although beholden to the radical politics of the late 1960s, Li Fuling's vision resurfaced in the early 1970s. After the fall of Lin Biao in 1971, Zhao Ziyang returned to Guangdong as the deputy party secretary. Under his leadership, the Guangdong provincial government partially reinstated the 3-5 policy in 1973. A small number of registered frontier res residents were allowed to conduct duty-free barter trade during their visits to Hong Kong. The following year, um, uh, the following year, 1974, an export commodity production base was reopened in Ba'an. After Mao's death in 1976, Hua Guofeng, the new chairman, dispatched delegations abroad to study experiences of capitalist economies. In April 1978, Representative, uh, representatives from the State Planning Commission and the Ministry of Foreign Trade visited Hong Kong and Macau. At the end of their visit, uh, the delegates conclude that Hong Kong's model of economic development should be a model for the mainland. Bai should be a launching pad for this learning process. Bai's party secretary at the time was Feng Bao, uh, as you can see from the image here, Feng Bao used to work under Li Fuling, and he had very rich experience in handling migrant crisis. Feng Bao took the visiting delegates um, to the border village called Wo Fang Sun. So the average annual income per capita was around 130 RMB for the villagers, but more than 130,000, sorry, more than 30,000 Hong Kong dollars for their neighbors across the border. In his report to national level policymakers, Bond revived Li Fuling's idea and gave it a slightly different name, use Hong Kong to enliven Bond. Uh, in the late 1970s, Bond was at the center of another migrant crisis. From 1978 to 1980, the Guangdong provincial government reported almost 500,000 cases of illegal immigration, one fifth of which was committed by Baan residents. Xi Zhongxun, the first party secretary of Guangdong province at the time, initially characterized the people fleeing to Hong Kong as corroded by a bourgeois way of thinking. After being confronted by an outspoken cadre in Baan, Xi Jinping, uh, not Xi Jinping, Xi Zhongxin, Xi Zhongxin completely changed his mind. He said, the peasants were most pragmatic. If we cannot improve their standard of living, they will never stay. Our talk about the superiority of socialism was empty to them. Echoing the ideas of the Li Ji leadership in 1961, uh, Xi Zhongxun designed a blueprint named Three Constructs, which aims to transform, transform Baan into an export production base of both agricultural and industrial commodities, a tourist destination for visitors from Hong Kong, and a new type of frontier city. Under Mao, Li Fuling promoted rudimental ideas of reform ahead of his time, but he suffered se severe career setbacks as a result. Li Fuling, in this sense, was a poignant embodiment of bureaucratic entrepreneurism in the border town of Baan. Under Deng Xiaoping, local officials were given unprecedented, unprecedented decision-making power for the pursuit of profit-oriented goals. The Guangdong leader Xi Zhongxun was encouraged to imagine himself as the president of an independent nation of Guangdong and as the agile monkey king in the classic novel, The Journey to the West. With increased autonomy, Shenzhen officials copied certain grassroots practices of cross-border arbitrage. At the height of the Cultural Revolution, the Shoko commune on Ban's west coast had already been collecting reusable waste from Hong Kong for refurbishment and resale. After 1978, this kind of gray economy inspired the Hong Kong Merchant Steamship Group. So this, com this company managed the Shoko Industrial Zone, which was the first enclave in the PRC that accepted foreign investments. The person in charge of this pilot project was 
Yuan Gong. He was、um, born and raised in Baoan. Yuan Gong started the Merchant Group's capital accumulation through the processing of metal scraps from retired Hong Kong vessels. Cross-border recycling also attracted the attention of Shenzhen Party Secretary Wu Nansheng. Wu Nansheng organized a special task force to purchase used tires, gasoline barrels, and cars from Hong Kong, and recommended bribing their way through the Hong Kong customs with "quote unquote" red envelopes or tea money if necessary. In August 1980, the National People's Congress approved the regulations on special economic zones in Guangdong Province. This legislation formally authorized the special economic zones to offer foreign investors tax incentives and protection of their assets. Meanwhile, in 1980, the British Hong Kong government tightened its immigration policies. The population outflow from Shenzhen gradually reduced. Once a Cold War division of opposing ideologies, the Shenzhen Hong Kong border became reconstituted into a mechanism of differentiation, following the logic of global market forces. I'm going to conclude here by discussing three broad themes. The first is about、uh, about confrontation, negotiation, and accommodation on Cold War borderlands. Although Cold War Hong Kong has often been compared with Cold War Berlin, substantial differences exist between the East-West German and the Sino-British divisions. In contrast with the high tension between the two Germanies, the PRC and British Hong Kong authorities share a mutual interest in maintaining frontier stability, whereas the frontier communities in Germany internalize the division and develop oppositional identities. Very few from either side of the border seem to genuinely uphold the line between Baoan and Hong Kong in the 1950s and early 1960s. Throughout this period, lineage connections in the Pearl River Delta remain strong despite the ideological differences and the economic divergence between the two territories. As Bond officials noted in 1959, from the perspective of the natural environment, social and cultural customs, language, and lifestyle, a Sino-British border does not exist. Either is there a Sino-British border in the people's minds? The second point I want to make is about the state's flexi flexible sovereignty practices. Since the end of the World War II, we witnessed the universalization of sovereign states, but we also see the worldwide proliferation of enclaves of exception, exceptions. So, what what are enclaves of exceptions? These include special economic zones. Export processing zones and free ports. Scholars such as Ronan Palan and Vanessa Ogolo has reminded us that this shadowy、um, offshore world、um, or the capitalist archipelago is not a deviation from our world organized by and into sovereign states. On the contrary, governments deliberately created these zones to maximize capital accumulation. And just part of new liberalism in the global 1970s, when the Reagan-Thatcher revolution drove Western cooperation into the developing world in search of lower labor costs and less tax burdens. Although its initial growth was also fueled by labor-intensive sectors, Shenzhen is unique. When compared with other special economic zones, because it was the social laboratory for China's reform. The PRC's reform and opening also rely on a strategy of what sociologist Iwa Ong called "graduated sovereignty." The relatively disarticulated Shenzhen Special Economic Zone was a crucial policy instrument that helped the Chinese economy incrementally grow out of plan. Last but not least, I hope this study can help us reflect. Upon the 1978 divide in modern Chinese historiography, if, as Balzac had it, behind every great fortune there is a crime, then China's story from of reform and opening under Deng Xiaoping began with 
transgression under Mao Zedong. In the context of the creative transgressions of the borderland people, reform was a process of the central government's legalization and appropriation of market-oriented grassroots practices that previously had been regarded as illicit. Across the 1978 divide, the local drive to leverage the border town's unique position as a hinge for linking socialism and capitalism had been consistent. However, the legal parameters for economic activities set by the state shifted. A messier, non-linear genealogy of Shenzhen embedded in the everyday and dating back to the height of socialism help us understand the 1978 divide not as a duality between continuity and change, but as an evolving negotiation between the borderland society and the central government. Despite asymmetries, unevenness, and inequality under one party rule, this liminal space produced new power dynamics and new economic institutions on the basis of what have previously been regarded as circumvention and subversion. Fang Bao, the former party secretary of Ba'an once commented, it was not we, which he meant the Communist Party cadres, educated the masses. The people taught us a lesson. Well, this is the end of my presentation and I look forward to comments and questions. All right. Yeah, thank you so much, Tom, for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, I particularly like how you uh, sort of challenge what we, what I think is so common in terms of the 1978 divide. I think that that is really where um, your research does, um, you know, shine, really shine a new light on things. Um, so we already uh, have our first question. So I think we should probably uh, get started right away. Um, before I do so, though, uh, just a reminder again, if you have any questions um, uh, for uh, a Tom Moore, please just uh, uh, submit them through the Q&A button and I'll read them out now uh, then uh, 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 for her to answer. Um, but I'll start with doing that right away with our first uh, question now, uh, which comes from uh, uh, Jarek Zawatsky. Um, and he asks, uh, were there any regular economic relations between uh, pre Dong uh, Bao An and uh, the Kowloon walled city? Call. Thank you, Jar Jarek, for your question. Just, I don't really know. I haven't. I haven't seen. Um, I haven't seen any official re records about the economic relation between pre Dongbao and Kong War City. If I, um, John and Gaza, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. The Kong War City was built after. Was that after 1960, this 1962 immigration crisis I described earlier? Was that right? So, um, in other words, you can say the construction, like the housing crisis and uh, water shortage, all the pressure on uh, the provision of public services in Hong Kong was somehow interlinked with um, you know the government policy in terms of what is legal and what is illegal between Bahá'í and Hong Kong and the flow of people. But I don't really know, hmm, I don't really know about the economic relations between Bahá'í and Kowloon War City. Sorry about that. Sure. Um, the next question comes uh, from the Institute's director, Professor Angela Lung. Um, and she asks, uh, how about uh, the maritime border? How was it policed in the 1960s? And does it play any role in the changing partnership between Hong Kong and Bao An? Um, thank you so much, Professor Long, for the excellent question and for the encouragement. Uh, really great honor to have you attending the talk today. A great question about the maritime border. So um, if I'm going to pull back to the, I think the um, map, Maybe it's a little bit tricky to show the map. So the maritime border, I think, is more difficult to survey. 
And also, um, for example, on the West End, the Shoko Commune, I think uh, Dennis Ho in, at Yale, she's writing a very interesting article about oyster farming. Uh, so very interesting. I think the, um, the farmers, they were kind of mobilized to play two roles, right? So they were uh, organized into local militias and they were actually encouraged, provide, provided incentives to um, conduct surveillance among their own commune members against illegal migration. But at the same time, they also, they kind of, they also um, organize um, like collective uh, illegal border crossing at the same time. So uh, it's a very tricky kind of seesaw relation between the state and the borderland society in the sense that I think the people were kind of leveraging uh, across the border. They, it's, not, it's not a great surprise, for example, like people in the maritime border uh, overseeing border control, these commute chiefs or collective chief, they will capture people who cross the border illegally. But at the same time, when the situation worsened, they will, when they seize the opportunity, they will also took charge of organizing everyone to cross the border illegally to Hong Kong. Um, so the maritime border on the West End is uh, it's very interesting. I think it's, it's more porous and it's more um, difficult to survey in a way because um, the sea border is it, it's very difficult to police. It was more than just uh, land and sea borders, wasn't it? I mean, I was, I'm not even sure if there was only one border. And if, we, if yeah. you go beyond um, just, uh, the, well, if you were to zoom in on the touch base policy period, the border was boundary street. You, you don't just touch base in anywhere in the new territories and you become a you know, Hong Kong resident. You, you need to go farther into the urban area. So it, this, is, this is a great um, story. It, it um, asks us to think about Baoan and also think, asks us to think about different areas in, in um, Hong Kong. Um, yeah, absolutely, to, it's to multi-layered, right? Yeah, yeah. It's multi-layered and Hong Kong, the new territory or Lofosan part of Hong Kong you're right, John, doesn't count as Hong Kong, right, for you to obtain legal permit during that period. Thank you for that. Um, All right, thank you. Um, the next question comes uh, from Moritz Arnold. Um, I think you've actually talked about this already, but uh, the question is, uh, do you see any similarities regarding the border security situation um, between Hong Kong, Shenzhen and uh, East and West Germany? I thank you, uh, Maurice, for the question. Yeah, I, I talk a little bit about the comparison. I think one more thing maybe I can emphasize is that um, the Hong Kong Shenzhen border was not mined, right? There were no landmines. And uh, the fence, uh, as far as I know, was only erected uh, after 1977. Uh, 1957, so after the 1956-57 migration crisis that a, um, a border fence was erected and it was later fortified, but however, it's still possible, right? Like um, it's more permeable. So in other, wor in other words, it's less militarized. It's um, there and also the East-West Germany border uh, is more like um, international Cold War frontier in the sense that there was the presence of the United States and Soviet Union, whereas the Hong Kong Shenzhen border was just Britain and China, and there is kind of a tacit agreement to maintain the status quo. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, maybe just touching upon that, um, sort of a, a question that came to my mind is also that um, the comparison with East and West Germany um, is different, or maybe it's different in the sense that, um, I mean, the Berlin Wall was particularly put up by uh, East Germany because there was a concern about too much migration out of sort of too much, too many people basically fleeing uh, East Germany. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems from what you suggest that people in Bauan certainly didn't really have a, well, didn't really have that much of a problem with people crossing the border. So maybe is that another difference that uh, if, if we think about what maybe the PRC central government or the people in Bao'an felt about, uh, you know, they probably, were they concerned about too many people crossing the border and going over to Hong Kong? Or, um... I think if the, my speculation is that if the initial 3-5 policy didn't change, the Bao'an locals 
probably would prefer to act as the in-between so that they can leverage the resources across the border, right? So, um, for example, in the early 1950s, uh, it was a period of high hope. Lots of bond, uh, peasants got uh, allocated more land. So for them, it's like, I take the boat to Hong Kong to, uh, to yim cha, to, to, you know, have breakfast, eat dim sum, and then I, I buy some product and then I come back, right? So I can sell like everything, like the Chinese medicine herbs, which can be sold at high value or oysters that can be sold at high value to Hong Kong. And then I come back to kind of conduct my social reproduction in Bond because everything is cheaper. I, I agree with you, Gazala. It's it makes more sense economically for the bondners to stay where they are and cross the border for making money. But I think the central government was concerned in the sense that Bond became kind of a transit station for people from even more inland China, right? Interior China to flee to Hong Kong. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, the next question that we have comes uh, from our colleague, uh, Philip Tai. Uh, he says, uh, thank you, Professor Zhou for sharing your fascinating presentation. Um, your research is truly admirable. Um, I think it makes very important contributions crossing the 1978 divide and helping us rethink the genealogy of China's reform and opening. Now his question is, uh, besides petty entrepreneurs and farmers, were there Chinese companies, communes, or state-owned enterprises, enterprises that also crisscrossed the Bao'an Hong Kong border for profit? Right, right. Philip, thank you so much for your question. Thank you for coming to the talk. And uh, your work is a great inspiration for this project. Uh, regarding your question, definitely. So um, in Baoan, for example, there is one case that uh, the peasants feel very hurt because uh, they there is one commune that grew uh, garlic uh, using smuggled seeds they obtained from their relatives in Hong Kong. And later, the county export and import collective came to them and basically acquired all these garlic and sold them for, um, for state revenue. So this line between what is private and what is state-owned is very blurred. And the peasants, of course, in this case, complain a lot. They say like, oh, we always think about the state, but the state never take care of us, right? Um, and other examples for uh, the communes, they are very active kind of, and very enterprising. So I heard a story, I, I saw in the, rec, uh, the documents uh, about this commune that they basically ship, ship people to Hong Kong and they have an office in Hong Kong, which is a cafe. <laughs> and they invested all the money in the cafe and it's also a, a front that will oversee anybody who arrive in Hong Kong to make sure they make all the payment uh, after their arrival. So it's a very kind of almost like contemporary, whether you say it's human trafficking range or any kind of immigration agency, right? Uh, they, and also there are lots of uh, bond communes that secretly have like kind of off uh, hold offshore accounts uh, in Hong Kong banks. Interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, the next question comes from our colleague, Angie Becker. Um, and she ask, uh, asks, could you speak to how domestic labor was uh, figured into economic contact between Baoan and Hong Kong uh, during the socialist period? Domestic labor. Thank you, Angie, for the question. By domestic labor, do you mean uh, like, um, like very gendered labor in a sense, like cooking. Um, yeah, that's that's a very good question. I think gender uh, gender division of labor is a very important uh, thread in this study. In the sense that usually, um, the like for example, by nineteen seventy eight, uh, when the Shenzhen Special Economic Zone, when the reform and opening started most of those who were left in Shenzhen were actually women, right? Women and the elderly. And um, gender domestic labor in the sense, um, and also of course, they were women who tried to kind of, um, you know, marrying to Hong Kong, marrying somebody with family um, connections in Hong Kong is always, 
a way for upward social mobility. Um, and by domestic labor, the PRC, at least the Ba'an Kamu, um, during the Great Leap Forward period, did provide better childcare. There was like kind of Kamu, a village owned childcare facility. Um, but because of the economic difficulty, as you can imagine, the, the quality of the care provided was not good. Um, it was also a period, as I s remember from seeing from the document, there are uh, women, women uh, commune members who complained that they were not given uh, time to leave uh, to breastfeed their newborn babies. And so, um, but for illegal migration, women were also in a disadvantageous position, right? So physically, if you have to swim across um, either to Lofosan or you want to cross the Xinjiang River, a uh, woman physically was disadvantaged, so they're more vulnerable, right? Uh, there were many cases of women being uh, sexually harassed or raped either by police or um, kind of have to sexually bribe their communal leaders in order to obtain the legal permission. So that was that was pretty common during this period. That's also somewhat reflected in um, the way they are labeled here in Hong Kong as well, um, wasn't it? Uh, you first have the label of multi but the, the male arrive, arriving, um, uh, I don't know, um, migrants, um, the Atan, that was a label for guy. And then you have the label of Biu Sok before you have a label of Biu Jie. So I think if you can uh, think through the um, cultural um, productions that we have in Hong Kong, you can also see the, the gendered aspects of the movement of people in the different layers. Definitely, definitely. And um, and also there are left behind wives, I think, who yeah. wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't hear from their husband for, for several decades in, in Bonn. All right. Um, the next question, or rather two questions it is, uh, come from Anthony Lee. Uh, and he says, thanks a lot for this interesting presentation. I have a question about the cross-border trade in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, you mentioned the people from about untraded goods with people from Hong Kong legally and illegally. So the question is, what was the attitude of the central government in Beijing towards this? Did they give tacit consent uh, to such transgression or stated policy, or they just did not know about it too much? Mm -hmm. And the second question uh, then is about methodology. Um, uh, to what extent do you think the archives in Bao'an are uh, trustworthy or reliable? Well, excellent question. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, regarding the first question, I think the central government had knowledge, but um, this probably goes back to Philip's study and also goes back to like a body of literature about the second economy in socialist countries during the Cold War, right? The state acknowledged it um, formally on the paper, it's forbidden, but the state sometimes didn't have the capacity to carry out the, the, the legislation. And at the same time, it's a strategy basically for everyone to survive, right? To overcome the constraints of planned economy. Um, I do think this phenomenon is not just uh, restricted to the Pearl River Delta. Of course, the Pearl River Delta was the hotbed for smuggling, but uh, I think there are recent studies by Adam Frost at Harvard. He focused on the Yangtze River Delta, so the Huaxitun in uh, Jiangsu and Shanghai area. It, it was pretty rampant, right? Black market, marketeering, private business, right? Um, I think the, the the, the policymakers in Beijing knew about it, but they had this, like there, you can see the pendulum of uh, politics kind of facilitated from, you know, tightening restriction and then more liberalizing, right? In the 1950s and 60s. The second question about the archives in Bonn, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, a little bit about my positionality. So I'm from Shenzhen. I have the Shenzhen household registration, which enabled me to visit the Ban County, Ban County archives. So where is Ban County archives? Uh, it's tucked in a really like a nondescript residential area uh, in the western part of Shenzhen. It's Usually, it's not visited by historians. Most people go there to gather a marriage certificate, 
there are actually uh, lots of Hong Kongers who came back to pursue like, you know, land property, legal disputes over property. So they want their like uh, previous documents when we're still in Baoan. And so I was one, like, I think during my time of research there, I was the only historian. And uh, as a result, there was less kind of control and surveillance. Um, I do think they are trustworthy, more trustworthy than the Guangdong Provincial Archive. But first of all, by trustworthy, I mean, I don't, none of the documents I saw had been revised or redacted, that's for sure. Uh, that's what I saw. And um, compared to the Guangdong Provincial Archive where everything is digitalized and you have to apply and get approval from an archivist, Bon County Archives is less control. So you basically have access to everything. The things they don't let you see, they will lock it up in the cabinet. It's very straightforward, very basic, <laughs> very rudimental. I don't think it's a problem about the state distorting existing, existing documents. I think it's a problem of state restricting access. I think what you see are all true are true in a sense that these are not fabricated or like you know manually like manufactured, but I think it's the selection that through the state's selective release of documents that the state try to kind of engineer historians narrative. Yeah, thank you. Um... Well, there's another follow-up uh, from Moritz. I know that we have any ask whether we know anything about fatality and fatality statistics uh, for the border. That's a great question. I don't have the exact number. Um, I don't have the exact number, but I understand in 1962, the May migrant crisis, because it coincided with a huge flood of the Shenzhen River, there was definitely fatality caused by accidents such as um, drowning in the sea. Um, the PRC border control did um, shoot people who were trying to cross the border illegally. That did happen, but I don't think is as, um, I, I don't have the exact number, but I think overall it's not as stringent as the border, say, between North and South Korea or East West Germany, because there were two cases, like in the two cases, two migrant crises in 1957 and 1962, there were clear instructions from the top down telling the border control not to shoot. And just what they should do is to confiscate any document the migrant carry so that uh, the, the Hong Kong authority wouldn't blame the PRC for letting all these people to flood Hong Kong. And they were just, um, the, the documents said the border control should just educate uh, the illegal migrants about the whys of capitalist Hong Kong and then just secretly let them go. So, um, and between like in the 50s and 60s, there are also cases of, um, people being executed, publicly executed for illegal migration. Uh, however, these cases were also kind of, is are more performative, right? For kind of instilling a sense of terror uh, among the local community. And these are also kind of, uh, I, I wouldn't think that's the norm, but there, are, there were definitely cases of capital punishment against illegal migrants. So, yeah. Um, the next question comes from uh, Chiu Zichan, uh, and she asks, uh, how, does the how do the farmers, uh, or how did the farmers from the northern Shenzhen, or from northern Shenzhen participate in the border trade? Yes, excellent question, uh, Zichan. This is actually one of the uh, reviewers for my article asked the same question. <laughs> so maybe it's, it's you. So it um, definitely, there's a, uh, as John mentioned, like Hong Kong's water is kind of multi-layered, right? So Shenzhen, if you look at the geography, absolutely. Those at the south of Shenzhen boarding Hong Kong benefit more from cross-water trade and they are more likely to have you know, relatives in Hong Kong, family ties in Hong Kong, trade relation with Hong Kong. Those at the north, so bordering two counties, uh, Dongguan and Huiyang, uh, they were less likely to participate in the cross-border trade. So initially the 3-5 policy targeted only those, the communes 
bordering Hong Kong and later expanded to those in the north. But uh, those in the north had another border to leverage, right? That is Shenzhen with the interior, right? During this period, there was an official border, but later during the early reform period, there was a second line, the Ar Xian between Shenzhen and inland, right? So that's another kind of uh, two different value regimes where the peasants in North and Shenzhen could uh, profit from. Um, we've got another question uh, from Professor Leung. Um, and she asks, uh, or she wants to ask about uh, the archives once more, um, and whether you could say anything about um, what the strongest or most useful collections there are for, for scholars. Right. Uh, thank you, Professor Leung, about the archives. I do think the Bond Provincial Archive is, uh, is for me, is a treasure trove. So I did my archival research in uh, 2017 and 2019. Um, I basically collected documents in 50s, 60s, a little bit in 70s and 80s. Uh, these did show a very, it's a very different picture from what we already know. And it was also, there. there is also a, a four volume collection called um, Shenzhen, like um, archival collection in Shenzhen 30 years after the establishment of the PRC. I, I'd be happy to send you the link. So it starting from actually the Ming Qing period all the way to the 1970s. This was published in the early 2000s. Uh, as you know, this is a very different political environment. And archivists uh, in Shenzhen actually included lots of material that wouldn't be possible to publish nowadays. So these are really good collection, very, very useful. Uh, these are probably the two most important sources for me for the study of Bala. And later for, for the larger book project, I'm uh, now looking at um, the Shekou, Xiaoxi Bao, Shekou News. So as you know, Shoko was the first enclave to accept foreign investment. It was also the place where Yuan Gong carried out democratic election in 1989. So um, I also collected a whole uh, newspaper collection from 1985 to uh, 1991. Um, I, for, for beyond that, probably I would need to rely on, um, you know, like, other institutions. So I want to study a power plant in Shenzhen, kind of echoing Gusson's research on the China electri uh, electricity. Uh, so pro I'll try to access um, the, the power plant's own archival collection and see if uh, they will give me access. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question comes from Wang Wing. Um, and the question is, uh, how does the central government include the border people in Bao'an into its dynamic uh, United Front policy at the beginning of the 1980s to justify its support uh, for the special economic zone idea? Mm, great question. Thank you, Wang Yun. Um, in the 1980s, it's true. <laughs> it's um, talking about United Front, so basically it's a reversal of policies, right? So those who um, bonders who settled in Hong Kong who used to be accused as uh, Tao Gang Fan, like uh, you know, basically they they committed the crime of escaping to Hong Kong. Now they are potential investors, right? So how do how do they how do the uh, government welcome them back? So they actually did the same thing in the 1960s. Uh, so in the 1960s, so those who left. Uh, the punishment is that, so they are in Hong Kong, there's nothing to, nothing the Bang county government could do. However, their family had to purchase what they call gao jia liang, means like inflated uh, uh, grains with inflated, uh, pun uh, punitively inf inflated price, which means that in, you know, socialist bond, the grains should be pretty cheap. But for the left behind family of the escapees, uh, they had to pay extra price. At the same time, um, they, you know, the, the, the labor quota will be shared by the whole com community, right? As you can imagine, when the escapees came back in 1961, when uh, the Bang County government was implementing the uh, 3-5 policy, 
the, the county seat will roll out the red carpet, you know, we'll treat them with cigarettes and tea, and people are really upset. So basically, escaping to Hong Kong is a rapid route for so upward social mobility. You were escaping before, and now when you came back, you were patri uh, patriotic Hong Kong compatriot. So that created a very ironic mechanism or distorted mechanism, encouraging more people actually to flee to, to Hong Kong. So that's the same pattern in the 1980s, right? So in the 1980s, there was another uh, migrant crisis and it only gradually trickled down when Hong Kong changed its touch base policy. Thank you. Um, because there are quite a few questions about that um, archival, the, the collection of archival, Materials that you mentioned, that's the Jianguo uh, Is it? Because yeah. then I could uh, okay. I could just post the the link in the okay. chat and then everyone. Well, um, I can hold on and I can pull it out from my bookshelf. Sure. So this is um. So this is volume one. Um, ah, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, Mingguo, uh, Mingguo Shi Qi Shen Zhen Yi. This is it. And then, right. uh, so the most uh, helpful ones for me are the volume two. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I think I found it, so I can I can just um, post it in the, in the chat for everyone. Uh, so for those, in, so for, for the colleagues in Hong Kong, you can try the Kung Fu Zi, uh, old book. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's very useful. So I think all four volumes are available on Kung Fu Zi. And for Philip, you probably could try interlibrary loans, or I think definitely uh, American university libraries should have a copy. If you don't have, if you don't have it, just email me and I can, I think, uh, part of the volume four was digitalized, so I'd be happy to share. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just thought I'd point it out because quite a few people were asking about that. Um, uh, we have another question from Adonis Lee, and uh, the question is: Thank you, Dr. Joe, uh, for the talk. Uh, did communist organizations in Hong Kong, for example, the China Travel Service or the New China News Agency, play any role in facilitating uh, Bao An uh, Hong Kong relations? Hmm, thank you Andres, for the question. Hmm. China, I from the period I studied, not really. I think they, the China News Agency was more kind of, a, um, maybe John and Gazin can correct me if I'm wrong, it's more like a, a focusing on high politics, uh, like international relations or diplomacy, right? Very, it's a little bit different. I think it's, um, jurisdiction is a little bit different. It's more high level beyond the kind of grassroots cross-border relations. Um, the China Travel Service, um, it did appear in the documents. Uh, China Travel Service, you really facilitate like officially sanctioned uh, back and forth movement between Hong Kong and Shenzhen, right? So. For example, the foreign visitors who came to the Shenzhen Theater for uh, art performances, those probably were arranged by the China Travel Service. Um, but in the later period, um, I'm now working on case of the overseas Chinese town in Shenzhen, the China Travel Service play a very important role uh, in constructing the Shenzhen landmarks such as the window to the world and uh, the China folk village. All right, thank you. Um, we have a question from our colleague, uh, Christopher Sapla, and he asks, uh, well, he says, great talk. Um, I would be interested in hearing a little more about people who crossed the border from Hong Kong uh, to Bao An, uh, because yeah, you mentioned uh, attempts to develop a region for tourism, for example. Uh, to what extent did Bao An draw in Hong Kongers uh, for different purposes during the pre-special uh, economic zone uh, period? 
Yeah, thank you very much for the question, Christopher. Uh, so one <laughs> historical witness who actually visited uh, Shenzhen during this period was Professor uh, Ye Haming, Ye Haming Lao, she's from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. She went, uh, it was also like the period of when there was left-wing movements in, in Hong Kong, right? So she crossed the border with her group of friends to watch uh, a Chinese documentary called Chang Ye. So I kind of propaganda documentary. Uh, so according to her, like it, it was a popular activity for Hong Kong University students who had left-wing inclinations, right? But she was soon disillusioned because then later she saw all the illegal migrants who swarmed to the seashore next to the CUHK campus, right? So uh, all that image of a pr prosperous socialist China soon fell apart. There are also other people, I guess very similar to the situation now, like famous entertainers were also frequent visitors to, to Shenzhen. Uh, whether it's for propaganda or for art exchange. I know Patrick Xie, uh, Xie Tingfeng's father, he went and it was highly publicized and several other um, high profile entertainer from Hong Kong also visited. So that would be, I, I guess uh, for this ongoing project, I think, I hope I can write a chapter about the Shenzhen Theater House during this period. <laughs> I was just um, taking a hike right outside of the border this past weekend. It was actually quite interesting to uh, hear the stories of um, people who claimed that they had all their connections to the Shenzhen side of the border, um, primarily through dialect groups. And now you can just look across the river and it's quite a different scene on the Shenzhen side, which is a lot more prosperous. And I just feel that it's almost a matter of time that that would be um, the type of scene that we have in between uh, Jim Sha Zhui and Central on the mm -hmm. Victoria Harbor, the discrepancy is too large. And I, if if uh, border controls or um, other regulations are going to be transformed, um, it would be a, quite a different look that that area is going to take. Um, I, if I understand correctly, what we are talking about here is that uh, we have a transformation of Shenzhen being more backwater, uh, more of a buffer zone. Um, to a copycat, and then to an overachieving um, sibling. Um, and th that, that transformation was so rapid, and from the Hong Kong side, as, uh, at least, many it caught many people by surprise. As a matter of fact, I think there are still many who are still in denial of that. Um, and as you mentioned, that, that stems from immigration policy, changes in immigration policy uh, situation in mainland China, and also Hong Kong's uh, 1997 problem. How, how should we explore that? I, I guess it's uh, very much a blind spot for me. Uh, we tend to look at Hong Kong's entrance in the Shenzhen uh, region, which is very much belated. Uh, but what you're talking about is that there's a much longer process that probably involved um, political leaders stationed in that part of uh, the borderland. Um, should we be thinking about that along with the uh, along the dialect groups of those people, their provincial allegiance, because the it it might have been um, an area with a lot of uh, language ties before. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be as much so anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I just I, I just want to see how we should pursue that further. Absolutely, John. I think that's an excellent part. Language is is key, right? In in the what is going on right now between the China-Hong Kong border. So Shenzhen is known as a kind of a Putonghua Mandarin speaking city in Guangdong. Mm. I think one one thing I observed, like for example, the leaders are um, like uh, Li Fuling, he's a northerner. He was transported from Hebei, uh, but he, very, in Chinese from very jidi qi, he understand local situation very well and he, uh, you know, he adapted to the local situation. And Ji Feng Ting, his partner, the county chief, he's, uh, he's a Bon native. So he's very, um, he, he's very, how to say, like, um, they call him Bo So, like very uh, deeply kind of attached to local society, local community. Is he um, Hakka? He is not Hakka, but Hakka is a very in, in, interesting community, right? Uh, um, I was looking at another, I, I'm curious, like, how is the Hakka community in Hong Kong? Because 
I'm looking at this um, Hakka lineage in Longgang. This is in inland Shenzhen. And they had this tradition of uh, migrating uh, like in Professor Elizabeth Singh's work, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Crossing over to South America, to Jamaica. And, um, and nowadays they're still in Longgang. And uh, so, Oh, we have an audience from Longgang. Yeah, are you Hakka? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so there is a very interesting documentary for those uh, for the Chinese if you're interested about uh, um, about a woman whose uh, grandfather was from Longgang, <laughs> but she, she's now living in uh, Chicago, and her mother was a mixed child of a Jamaican mother and a father from Longgang, and later she, the mother. Yeah, Jamaica Hakka is super interesting. So this woman later made a pilgrimage back to Longgang, to the Hakka community uh, and reconnected with, with the family. Um, so, so yeah, the Hakka community is, is, is super interesting. I'm also looking at, this is not really um, somehow related to Shenzhen, uh, Hakka people in Vietnam who were expelled in the Third Indochina War and later resettled in China. So I traced the group to Jiangxi in inland China. And they had like family members who were settled in Guangming Farm. So Guangming Farm is the farm which supply milk to the Vita soil. Um, the thanks for the recommendation uh, of Veronica Mock's work mm -hmm. uh, about milk crates, right? So uh, Guangming Milk signed a contract with Vita soil and supply over 60% of Hong Kong's fresh milk. So the laborers, uh, basically they exploited refugee labor <laughs> from, from the Hakka Chinese from Vietnam during that period. So that's very interesting. I, get, I don't know, I kind of deviated from your question, John. Um, no another, I think another strategy the government did, I do think the, the government try to kind of shift the political orientation democratic composition of Xinjiang after reform. Mm -hmm. So before reform, I think they were more organic connections, right? They're all like Cantonese or Hakka or dialect speaking. After reform, uh, one another group I traced were the People's Liberation Army Engineering Corps. So they are from all across China, mostly from uh, the third front. And they were transported to Shenzhen to start infrastructure. So this is not just a, a, a very important, very disciplined source of labor, but this is a frontier strengthening strategy. Right? They are um, they are basically veter PLA veterans, politically very loyal, very dependable, and they are Mandarin speaking. They're, they're from all across China, kind of diluted. The, the organic connection between uh, Shenzhen and Hong Kong in a sense. Yeah, well, then your story takes us to, um, I, I don't know, the, the 80s and the 90s when Hong Kong was still the, um, the, the rich cousin, um, now not quite as much. Um, and, and that process puzzles me. Uh, what you're talking about here is uh, basically the, if not the destruction of a social fabric, at least overlaying on top of the uh, pre-existing social fabric of maybe Hakka-speaking people, or other dialects, with a whole group of people, uh, those of us in Hong Kong might not connect with quite as readily. Right. And, and with that, in a couple of decades, uh, that space got totally transformed, and our connection is not quite the same as before. So let's work more on that. That's fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that's a good. Uh, yeah. It's a good hint. I mean, unless there are there any um, other final questions, um, I'd once again uh, like to uh, thank Dr. Joe very much for uh, taking the time to speak to us about this, uh, about your wonderful uh, research um, and for answering all the questions uh, so patiently. And yeah, just to echo John, we are all looking forward uh, to hearing certainly more about your research and uh, but more from uh, from from uh, this book uh, project, um, having already learned so much from your talk today, in particular. Um, yeah, and also uh, thanks uh, to everyone uh, for tuning in. Um, we'll have uh, so the Delta on the Move project will have a series of lectures going uh, through the uh, through this uh, through the year, um, and we'll advertise them uh, as normally uh, through the website and email list and social media and so on. So please have a look at that. Um, yeah, but uh, once more, uh, Tom, thank you so much for taking the time and uh, 
yeah, I hope uh, I see you and all the others um, at the next Delta on the Roof uh, lecture. Thank you, Gatan. Thank you, John. Thanks thank you. for coming. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.